can't we two go walking together out beyond the valley of trees out where there's a hillside of heather curtsying gently in the breeze that's what i'd like to do see the heather of May is in the gloaming And all the clouds are holding still So take my hand and let's go roaming Through the heather on the hill The morning dew is blinking yonder There's lazy music in the rain And all I want to do is wander Through the heather on the hill There may be other days as rich and rare There may be other springs as full and fair But they won't be the same They'll come and go When the mist is in the gloaming And all the clouds are holding still If you're not there I won't go roaming Through the heather on the hill The heather
the presence in the world of form of the great white brotherhood in the person of our emissaries is seldom recognized by mortal men. In view of their consciousness, which is situated about the earning of their living, the acquisition of knowledge, stature, and future, there is little room within the folds of their consciousness for the knowledge of the sacred mystery. And in fact, they have an a priori disbelief, which before the fact already has decided that it is not. In view of such states of consciousness, which are almost universally present among the masses, we do not hold with the idea of spreading the teachings among the masses who are, in fact, possessed with these ideas. It is only to the few who become disillusioned with the social structure now existing among mankind and feel that there is little hope in society for the good life that we can turn to and expect because they have turned to us that there will be a rapport. This may seem at first to be very sad in a world where so much knowledge is stored up in books, in treatises, and in recorded records. Yet I think that if you will bear in mind the historical events of the past 10 centuries, or even go back further, 20, 30, 40, or 50 centuries, you will find that down through all the segments of history that the masses of mankind have followed a specific pattern which they themselves generated in response to leaders whose hearts had in fact rebelled against the creation as well as the creator, but who cleverly concealed these facts from those they sought to mislead and also pretended to disbelief in the powers of the invisible world. Because so much of the energy of the students has in the past gone into the one specific hope of saving mankind by bringing the masses of mankind into God awareness through making them aware of the great white brotherhood and the teachings which we purvey, I would like to call to your attention that this is in itself considered somewhat of a slow process, albeit we are fully aware of the great need and that the fields are indeed white unto the harvest. It is true that the orthodox religions of the world have in the main created very little progressive activity in the social structure and in fact have in most cases sat idly by while the world has made shambles of the very ideals which they hold. Even in days when religion held great power over state, there was a tendency on the part of humanity to compromise religious issues. And thus, failure has occurred again and again among the orthodox segments of religious consciousness which did at one time have the blessing of the brotherhood as a beginning school seeking to teach men or lead men toward the sacred mysteries of being. Now then, as we consider still further 
the situation. We wish to reveal to you that the Brotherhood has given great consideration to the large remnants of orthodoxy which still exist in the world, and we have concluded that these elements must, after a fashion, be included in our activity in the sense that we must seek to use them because there is not at the present time enough of the esoteric teachers in the world to reach mankind and therefore the remnants of orthodoxy must continue to be used albeit it certainly does not support the ideals of divine truth but falls short in many parts. We therefore have been required by the cosmic law and the karmic board to seek to produce in the orthodox world the renaissance of the good and the beautiful. Therefore a certain portion of the energy allotted to the earth from the great central sun has been diverted into these channels by the decree of the brotherhood in order to see if perhaps we can achieve something in the nature of a salvage operation for mankind before it is utterly too late. Then, lest you in some way be caught up in the wrong idea that we have turned our back upon the spiritual, upon the esoteric, upon the children of the light, let me hasten to assure you that such is not the case. We are renewing the flow of our energy into the world through the esoteric. But it is being done in such a manner as to seek now to produce responses in those individuals who are ready for the higher teachings and cease to waste our energy upon those whose very recalcitrance in nature would never permit them to respond in the balance of this embodiment. I think then that through a narrowing of the ray pattern, that is to say, directing the ray of the Christ, of the ascended master's consciousness into the world of those who are at least somewhat ready, we shall secure an additional response for a greater allotment of energy shall be conveyed to them than hitherto was possible when the pattern was one of diffusion and we sought in a general way to draw all into the esoteric. Now then, we shall use the orthodox in a manner calculated to produce some fruit of good works among them according to their consciousness and spirit of receptivity. The reason why I am bringing this to your attention today is in order to establish guidelines of contact with the world at large and also so that none among you will at any time feel that when the response which you seek in return for your noble effort does not bear the fruit that you would like to have, that you will not be discouraged by it in any means, but will recognize that the brotherhood is very active now through all the spiritual endeavors of the world, but most especially according to specific patterns through the esoteric world and also through the exoteric religious bodies. We shall watch this most carefully, we assure you. And if we find that the response generated in the orthodox world does not warrant that energy which we are pouring into them from this date forward, then we hasten to assure you it shall be withdrawn. For this is not a date fixed item, but is a matter of trial and error. For the ascended masters are fully aware that mankind's responses can never be predicted with great accuracy owing to the trivia, the trivial nature of the human will. Man is prone to trifle even with high principle. 
And because of this, there is instability in manifestation in his consciousness. That we may stabilize the brotherhood in those segments of outer consciousness dedicated wholly to the purposes of restoring the kingdom of God to the planet is our hope. And we do not, therefore, in any way ask you to stop the release of the light substance into your mind and consciousness that can, in one sense, be said to be the source from which dreams of God idealism are spun. Rather, we would prefer that you will continue to recognize that cosmic ideals and principles should be lifted up as never before. For these efforts in themselves do culminate ultimately in a manifestation of great beauty in the world, but most specifically in the world of the Chila, whose heart and mind, whose consciousness and being is thus prepared to take departure from the world of mortal thought and feeling and to live in the world but not of the world as a manifest radiant son of God. Because this hope has been realized many times, we are aware that it can be realized many times again and therefore it is our hope that you will not in any way forget those words that clearly delineate for mankind the law, with what measure ye meet out, it shall be measured unto you again. This tenet of the Great White Lodge is effective in all situations, and there are no cases whatsoever, even in the Ascended Master Octaves, where these principles are not adhered to. And therefore, when men appear to reap a reward of bitterness and pain, bear well in mind that yours is not to add to it by the weight of human condemnation. Rather, it is for the individuals to recognize that the errors of their ways which may be coming to them for redemption should in themselves be considered only as misqualified energy. And it should be clearly recognized on the part of the receiving one of what appears to be bane rather than blessing, that this is the opportunity for balancing past error. And therefore, no bitterness should be returned to the deity or resentment against the universal consciousness. This only prolongs the suffering and creates then a period of greater distress whereas acceptance of situations and that with full recognition that the will of God is for joy, peace, harmony, and good health should cause individuals to see each opportunity that comes to them in this manner as an opportunity for finding the secrets of beauty, success, happiness, joy, and the full use of opportunity in assisting others. Thus, karma is itself defeated, for karma in this case I reference as the negative, is self-defeated because individuals do not submit to their karma by bitterness, but they accept it with joy and proceed to balance it. And thus it is quickly, quickly, mind you, corrected, and the way is made plain whereby the spread of beauty in the world and the consciousness can continue. Because this is so very urgent among the chilas of the light, who are promised no specific immunity from karma by reason of their pursuit of the spiritual path, will be able to more speedily find themselves enabled to do our work among men and to hold forth the mighty tenets of the brotherhood 
with that full God determination which has enabled so many of the ascended masters in the past, ere they had won their victory, to attain to the full realization of its meaning. And thus, as the meaning came clear, they were able also to externalize the divine radiance before they made their ascension in the light and to spread great compassion among men everywhere. And this was true of St. Francis, and he is a most unusual example of such an externalization of beauty and a change from the consciousness of the world to the world of the light. I therefore, Alexander Gaylord, urge upon every one of you a realization of life as mission to be fulfilled. And this does not imply indulgence in the sense that you have a vessel filled with grains of sand, finite in number which are dumped through the sands of the glass as the sands of your life to which you are entitled and which you must enjoy because you are intended by God to enjoy it as you please and not without any sense of dedication to eternal principle. This is false. And therefore, I call to your attention that rather than outpicture that consciousness that you will not have a sense of your life as belonging unto yourself, but as unto God. And therefore, if your life belongs unto God, it is not finite, but infinite. And if it is infinite, then its purposes are for the fulfillment of the infinite. And you must re-educate your consciousness to find your joy in the things of the infinite, for the infinite is just that. It is forever. And certainly, if your consciousness does not become re-educated to enjoy the things of the spirit, you would be of all men most miserable in an eternal world where you could not for one moment exhibit in action those attitudes and pursuits which you desired, but rather were compelled in the infinite world to do those things which were contrary to your disposition. And therefore the re-education of the consciousness is utterly important, for the disposition of man then becomes a God disposition, that God disposes in man all proposals of man's consciousness. And thus beauty and love and light and life and wonder and the miracle of consciousness continue and men become free, truly free at last. This is the purposes of our brotherhood for all the earth. And I have brought you this message this day as a milepost upon your journey toward perfection. In the name of the spirit of the great white brotherhood, I bid you adieu. sign of the heart and the head and the hand to you. May the peace of your presence abide with you. Wherever you are, wherever you go, may the glorious peace in your presence flow. In days of service and nights of rest, may the peace in your presence keep you blessed. The sign of the heart, the head and the hand to you. The Thomas Cosmic Cross of White Fire, watch between thee and me as we are absent the one from the other.
and I welcome you into the domain of the brothers of the golden robe. And our eyes are fixed upon the purposes of the Supreme. And we know that those of you whose hearts have cherished the divine ideal will welcome us. And so, in the mutuality of Christ expansion, we shall share a moment together and with the brothers and the sense of brotherhood. When you examine the fabric of the world's thought today, and likewise turn the torch of your attention upon mankind's feelings, you will carefully observe that there is a great gulf fixed between the feelings and the thoughts of men. And in a spirit most incongruent with reality, there are too many riptides of feeling and too great an expression of intellectual brutality for mankind to be able to make the so needed progress in this interim of waiting while the brothers of the Great White Lodge are patiently waiting for mankind to cool their differences. And in a fond sense of hope for mankind are holding the immaculate concept while the consciousness of man, like the consciousness of Nero of old, fiddles while Rome burns. The tyrants of the past are replaced today by neighbors over the back fence. And yet, it does not seem so frightful as it would in the person of an emperor. The eyes of God gaze upon those who wear rags and crowns with equal sensitivity, knowing that here is a soul, a tender part of a cosmic whole, a precious thing that God has wrought, an image God has loved. And yet men say, in a baneful desire to claim for themselves the freedom which they know they ought to love, I wish to have a life for myself. I wish to express as I wish. Give me my freedom. The brothers of the golden robe, of course, know, as do so many of even the lesser luminaries amongst the spiritual seekers, how that there is a very real sense of deceit in this cry, I want to have a life of my own. What really then is a man's? What has he per se, a right to claim. Certainly not the lives of others. And in the great interconnecting and interacting laws of compensation, we very much question if men have a right to that life of their own, which they seem to desire to express. One may say why, and the answer is so simple that often brothers of light fear to utter it. May I deign to do so? First of all, the reality that God made and breathed into the divine image was fairer by far 
than aught that man could conceive of. And therefore, the fairest gift that God imparted to every waiting human heart was the origin of his purpose, the beginning of man's life apart of cosmic beauty from God's heart. We, who are the brothers of the golden robe, who have known the tenderness of God's love as it is penetrated into our minds, are aware of the greatness of the cosmic intelling. Men speak of intelligence, and they speak of beauty. Men speak of the lines of life and the confinements of life, and they do not know how that their freedom lies in the domain of the spiritual and the beautiful. And there are many things among men that are full of beauty, not the least of which is the expression of friendship between lives. And therefore, as I come to you tonight, it is in the fullness of a cosmic friendship which I feel for many of you who have reached out and known me, some among you as I was, St. Francis, the divine Pavalero, he who embraced the wind and the sand and the trees and the sky and the grass and the loveliness of nature and of the church at Assisi and those who helped me to build stone by stone the structure and edifice and the understanding of the tenets of the brotherhood and the realization of the divine seeking that is so necessary to the hearts of devotees the world around. What shall I say of the love of the brothers and of their tender supplication for me as I lay upon the ground dying, considering it not in any way a measure of the end of my life, but only a moment of beginning, a breath of refreshment after I had expressed that which God had done in me. And so, my friends, as I come to you tonight at the end of this class, freedom, this class devoted to St. Germain and the power of freedom in the affairs of men. It is to leave with you some reminiscent sense of the devout, of the power of devotion, of the power of love to stir the mind and the heart with visions of consummate reality a reality that is far superior to old memoirs, to old records and albums that men may gaze upon and say, there I was 20 years ago. I can tonight gaze upon those events and say, there you were, there I was 200, 300, 500, 1,000 years ago. It does not matter. We can go back to ancient Egypt or we can move forward to the time when I was in London and attended Oxford. We can reminisce concerning the time when I was known among men as Kuthumi Lal Singh. And so I consider you my fellows, those of you who have lately come to an understanding of the Christ, for I serve tonight with the great Master Jesus in illumining mankind as to the reality of themselves so that they may, in their seeing of self-reality, enter into the ritual of becoming that which they see. For, in fact, the mind of man, so capable with the brilliance of God, is able to assimilate so much more by far than all that which man has already accepted. But the problem is actually at the nexus of consciousness, where the crowding in of a multitude of thoughts, inanities and trivia, does prevent the entrance of the beautiful, the supreme, and the divine reality which God wishes to inject into the soul. 
because it is of himself a part of wholeness, a part of compassion for God. And as I say it, I say it unto you, have compassion for God. For in a very real sense, God is crucified daily in ye all and in us as well. For all of us who express a lesser measure of the deity of the absolute than what we do are actually retaining the beautiful spirit that God is within ourselves. And as we retain it within ourselves, it is crucified in our form and awaits the rebirth in us of the Christ image so that God may spring free from the cross of self and arise in a newness of life into the resurrection spirit of freedom from human bondage. Yet he has not minded it, not at all. He has given of himself so lavishly as energy goes forth, rushing out into domains of selfishness, not unto domains of selfhood, where God reality shining in all of its splendor pulsates in the ether. And as I come to you tonight, it is with the hope that the brothers of the golden robe may illumine you as to the meaning of life in a wider aspect that will change you in your relations to one another and to understand the meaning of brotherhood. Brotherhood is not as men think it is. It is a lingering of the essence that tied you all together when you stood before the throne as beads strung upon a string, the string of cosmic intent composing a circle, vast, and each bead a life, a pure and beautiful pearl, iridescent substance. And there the question of brotherhood was never brought forth. For all knew and saw clearly their origin and source. But then when men come below, there is often the defense of men against one another which must go and be cast aside. For it has no meaning or reality. Besides, it is a hindrance to the soul. And if men would but understand it and would search more completely for the goal, all of the brothers would find it so infinitely easier to be able to illumine men. Do you know that we spend more of our energy in helping the many parts of the body of God upon earth to understand one another than we do in helping them to understand their divine outpost of freedom, their own mighty I am presence. And it is the presence that will give them their freedom ultimately and not one another. And therefore, knowing this, the shadowed ones continually work to create patterns of mistrust, patterns of egoistic sophistry, patterns where men can appear to be wiser than one another. And by these patterns, there is spun through a coat of differences, a wall of separation between hearts. And God would have none of it. All of the walls must come down as the walls of Jericho of old, and they must be dissolved. But the teaching has said it. From the beginning it has spoken it. And men have known it, but they do it not. And therefore it is an act of doing which I must plead for and an act of doing when it is needed. For men do not mind it at all, not even for an instant. When they are together in consecration toward Christ's ideals and they discuss these ideals and these ministrations as though they were discussing a problem of calculus, of algebra, of geometry. or of Aristotelian philosophy. They discuss these things very casually, and they say, we know we must do this, this we must do. And then the moment comes, and what happens? 
there is a rushing forth of the energy of the emotional body in its unbridled self-control. I use the word self-control perhaps a bit bitterly. For there is no self-control in this unbridled act. It is a rushing forth of the energy of a man's life stream stored up as a coiled spring that saith, to all the world, I must at all costs defend myself. And what are they defending themselves for? For the person whom they feel they must defend themselves against has already lost self-respect and has already lost respect for them. And therefore, two straw men engage in a straw act that etches upon immortal substance delay senseless delay and both are unprofitable servants in all parts of an argument and so you see the coiled spring that men have created around the ego is actually a vain and terrible thing and if men would they could release it now tonight may i ask you then to do an act that I once long ago asked the brothers to do. May I do it in memory of the order San Franciscan? May I do it for you? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Remember that you have defense mechanisms. Remember that they are stored up within you that they seek to protect you. Will you give them to me tonight, these defense mechanisms? Will you give me these springs of coiled energy that I may return them to God in the universal? Yes. Then understand that in the giving you must never again touch them. If you shall ever again touch them, it is possible that all of the energy of all of the coiled springs of all in this group could return to you individually. If you give them up, if you give them up, and it must be determined by you, then give it with that understanding that you must not, that you dare not, that you durst not ever again touch them. You must let God be your defense. And if you should stand as Sir Thomas More between the tribunal, you must understand that your strength is as the strength of ten because your heart is pure and wishes harm to no man. If then in that sense you can give it to me, I shall take them from all those who shall give them and I shall offer them unto the universal and pray unto God that his light will cremate and forever terminate that energy of self-protection that has been frozen for so long within your force fields. Modes of protection, modes of shadow, unnecessary modes, and then the weight shall fall from your shoulders because that energy will return to you by the power of the angel to rest upon your head as compassion for those who are not so delivered. Do you understand that? Do you understand that then when you come, if you have done this correctly, into the presence of life streams who yet feel the need to defend themselves, who are filled with these coiled up springs of egoistic defense, that you will have the power of the angels to bless them as they despitefully use you? Do you know that this is the way of the Christ that Christendom has failed of all these years, yet a few of our brothers were able to externalize it and keep that vow within themselves, which they never told, no, never, unto any, and it has been kept until this hour when I choose to reveal it as a part of my mission as world teacher. Won't you please be seated? Because someone in the room wondered about this, I wish to say to you in memory of the Lord Christ 
that when Jesus was teaching some disciples long ago, he made the same statement which he made recently to a young boy in Phoenix, Arizona, who cried out in agony. He said to him, I will cleanse you because you have asked it. But beware lest the worst thing come upon you. And he said unto him, For when an evil force goes out of a man, it goeth out and seeketh other evil forces throughout the earth, companion forces, and then coming back to the house in which it had lived, it seeketh to enter in again, but cannot, because the door is barred. And then it taketh these other evil forces into that house that is swept clean because the gateway remains unprotected. And thus, I say to you, this coiled spring must not be picked up. It must be left permanently. And you must trust in God for your defense. I do not mean by that that you will be unprotected. I do not mean by that that you will have no defense. I mean that you will have a different protection, a different protection than you have ever had before, a protection of invincible reality. As a world teacher, feeling the responsibility of my office, I yearn to see among all the metaphysical groups of the world a greater measure of cosmic harmony, but I understand full well that there are spirals too involved in these things that people feel because they belong to holy orders that they must defend them against all enemies. And God would make of all orders one because unless they belong together, they are not worthy to be together. And they belong together. But it will not come because a dream is spun. It will not come because our hearts are one. But it will come because there is a hum of harmony that broadcasts into the world divine reality and if all express it and forget all the substance of psychic energy which they have imprisoned there will be no walls of hindrance to draw men together and they will be one even as we are one and the shepherd of the sheep shall have accomplished his mission. As I take my leave of you, will you remember how great the love of the Christ and of Kathumi is for the brothers the world around? Will you remember the words of the goddess of light as she speaks to you now? I thank you.
still was the theme of our conference in the Grand Teton and it was as a Christ Mass for the pageant of light was dramatized as the requisite expression of our brotherhood for the mankind of earth not only throughout this year but every year to come the terrors brought upon mankind by the many wars which have brought to the world domain so much distress and such a continual destruction of the divine potential within man was called to the attention of the delegates including your own beloved Sanat Kumara the failures of Christendom were outlined in retrospect we were made aware of the failure to convey the Christ message to mankind and of the seasonal drama which seemed to drain the rest of the year of the significance of Christ Mass. The courage of mankind may seem to be dauntless to many, but those of us who see clearly and hear the prayers of the soldiers upon the battlefields who know the moments of trembling that come to them, the moments of horror that they witness, and the chaos that is manifesting in the world order, know full well, as all men do, when they think and reflect that this cannot continue. It is a disgrace upon the marks of progress of civilization and society. It is a pestilence that not only wasteth at noonday in the area of the battle, but conveys to the world order a blow of great destruction. The presence of God in life is as a candle that seems to flicker and go out in the consciousness of men because of the distractions of the world order. They cry for assistance and they fear lest none should hear them. Yet the Brotherhood almost daily sends out immense cadres of assistance into the world of form. This is true not only in the sense of individuals going forth in the outer to teach and to relay cosmic truth to mankind, but also I am thinking of the great harvest of angels. I am thinking of the ministrations of the angels to mankind daily. And as this was pondered by the brotherhood and mankind's state of unawareness was pinpointed, the great need once again was brought home to us all. 
for the dissemination of truth, not only by the press, but by the spoken word, not only by the spoken word, but by the medium of radio and television. And so we directed that the matrix be established for ascended master radio and television programs to the world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Won't you please be seated? When this shall be done is not known, for a great deal will remain up to you and to the rate of progress that must be determined. The step has been taken from our octave, and it is our hope and perhaps one that you may understand in the dark areas of the mind as well as the light areas of the mind. And by the dark areas of the mind, I am not referring to that where there is no Christ light. I am referring to that which is hidden. That it is our desire to see live dictations eventually brought to the people of the world by television. We no longer care, nor do the messengers have concern as to what mortal opinion is. For the weight of mortal opinion is of no particular interest to us, seeing it is constantly changing as fads and ideas. But the changeless nature of the Christ mass is the perpetuation of the beauty of the light in the world of form. And the beauty of the light must replace the darkness of men's thinking. And the subconscious areas of the mind, that which has been called so often the darkened areas of the mind, must be lightened by the inflow of the wisdom of God. Now I would like to lift an idea for you. And the idea that I wish to lift is the idea that an idea can be lifted. Therefore, you have many good ideas in your consciousness, but they are somewhat like hurdles. You have a concept, blessed ones, of limitation concerning the height to which you ought to aspire. And there is a tendency on the part of mankind to pace themselves. And while we can understand clearly the meaning of realistic pacing, that you ought not to run at a pace greater than your heart could bear, yet we are also aware that the heart of man sustained by his presence is able to do a great deal more than the heart of man without consciously attuning with his presence. Therefore, who shall say what limit man shall put upon his activities of light? Yet it is a fact and undeniable that mankind have down through the centuries and even in the present day set unreasonable limitations for themselves. For example, as I am speaking to you, if I were to analyze the consensus of this room and of this class, I would say that there are far more of you in this class who think that you possibly will not make your ascension at the close of this embodiment than there are who do. And I must throw the glaring light of honesty upon what you think. I do not feel nor do the great ones who are with me that this is desirable. We feel that the most desirable quality that a man can have is to follow the Christ all the way in the regeneration. And if he sets limits upon his attainment by saying, I do not believe that I can attain this, there is little likelihood that he will succeed. In the case of Mr. Daniel Rayborn, 
who was a rather unreligious man in a sense of the word. I would like to point out to you that he was a man of great kindness, a man of a very beautiful temperament, a man who could accept St. Germain when he came to him. And therefore, when St. Germain told him that he had raised his wife, not a Rayborn, into the ascension. Mr. Rayborn asked, what did this mean? And St. Germain asked him if he understood how that Jesus had ascended. And he said that he did. And he said it was this that had been done for not a Rayborn. And thus, when in the cave of symbols, there was a meeting between Daniel Rayborn and his ascended wife, and he saw that her flesh was living and beautiful and that she was real. His heart was gladdened. And when St. Germain offered also to raise him in due course of time, he accepted the pressure of acceptance. And this is what you must do for goal-fittedness comes by reason of man's acceptance of a divine idea. There are many now in the ascended state whose contemporaries did not consider them fit subjects for the ascension. While the disciplines of Serapis Bay are a sure way unto the ascension, I wish to point out that for those who do not deem themselves able to pass through the rigors of his retreat but still would desire to have their ascension, that the safest and best thing for them to do is to begin an activity of goal-fittedness, to recognize that with God all things are possible, and to place securely in the hands of their God presence their total being. One of the greatest problems with mankind is that once they have placed themselves into the hands of their presence, they are so quick to pull themselves out from those hands once again. It is somewhat as though in the days when the Ark of the Covenant was traveling up the mountain and the bears were tottering because of the ruggedness of the terrain and the ark seemed wont to fall, that one man did reach out his hand to steady the trembling ark, as if God would permit his center to have been dashed to pieces below. Thus individuals often place themselves in the hand of their presence until for some outer reason they seem to feel that perhaps they better recall it, for God might fail. They do not realize that this is actually what they are doing. No. But this is what they are doing, for they place themselves in the hands of their presence mentally. But when the first test comes along, they quickly assume full charge of their own thoughts and feelings. And these thoughts and feelings often gravitate downward, away from the Christ ideal, away from the Christ mass, away from the idea of the Prince of Peace. And men are quick to go to outer protective devices for the protection which can be called forth from within. And in the states governing your health, I want to tell you that there is no greater protection to mankind anywhere than the saturation of his body by the light of God that never fails. People are often dosing themselves with pills. But when they recognize that a pill of light in each cell, that a little point of light and the amplification of that light through attunement with God can do more to flush out of their system unwanted qualities and to bring about perfection in those cells, they will realize that in the realm of the metaphysical, in the realm of the spiritual, in the realm of the mind lies the power of longevity, 
of good health, of spirituality, of harmony, and of all that is beautiful. When you maintain harmony in your feeling worlds, blessed ones, you are actively engaging in that which will produce harmony among men. Be then an exponent of harmony and of peace. For this is the will of God, and the message of the Prince of Peace proclaimed by the angels was not only intended to be celebrated during the Christ Mass season, but throughout the year, that each day may become a day of victory, of Christ victory, of awareness, of keen insight into the problems of the future, and of understanding how that preparation for tomorrow must begin today. And thus, the Great White Brotherhood, in its Grand Teton meeting this year, looking toward the victory of mankind, was very much aware of the need for future preparation, of the need for the intonation of the trumpet toward victory, of the need to inspire mankind periodically to the greatness that is within them, of the need to draw together the hearts of men and not push them apart, of the need for integration with divine ideals and of a need for greater cooperation between the forces of light in the invisible realm and the embodied chilas of the ascended ones here on earth. As a step in that direction, I have been authorized today to set you on a journey which may well provide for you all some insight into the great tides of your own reality. As a part of a high cosmic initiation, a new name is given to those counted worthy to walk in the footsteps of the Lamb of God. Therefore, I ask not that you shall begin a search for your new name by trying to find it through force, but I wish you to be made aware of the fact that we are now searching ourselves for the new name of our advanced chilas everywhere upon the planetary body and to convey that new name actively to them under the proper circumstances. But be very careful of this, that you do not engage in any psychic activities in trying to probe that which is not revealed. When this shall come, it shall come as the clear ring of a bell. It shall come as a precise intonation, as a complete record and not as a partial one. There will be no nickname, no half tone, but the clear sounding of the new name of the individual. Tell no man when you receive it. And when I say no man, I mean no man, no one. Boast not of it, but keep it as a part of your covenant with God, with your own mighty I am presence. For this is your eternal name. I recognize that there are some who have taken their new name and have revealed it by authority. This is a different matter. And you may as well know that the new name of Moria is Moria. For his real name is obscured and purposefully so. And his name Moria was chosen by his presence in the highest communion with his nature, Maraya. The Ma being the mother sound of the presence, the Ra, the father sound. Thus, his name was dedicated to the father mother God and to the expansion of the kingdom of Yod, Maraya. Moria upon earth and so his real name remains hid with Christ in God 
But the name Moria is the name, the covering name by which he is known. I think then that as you consider how that our council has debated this year as to just what activity should be done for mankind that you will be interested in the results. Hitherto, we have worked often on a world order basis and we have sought to do great things in the family of nations and with the kings and rulers of the world. We have even gone beyond all mankind's organized concepts into the Soviet Union and other places and we established a focus at one time at Tashkent. But I wish to call to your attention that these have not been as successful as the brothers felt in the assuaging of world problems, and therefore we have passed the torch to you. This year is dedicated to the ascended master Chilas of the world, and the brotherhood have decreed that they will turn their exclusive attention upon the nourishment of our best hope among men. And therefore, I come to you with joy because wherever there is a chila of the ascended masters this year, we are taking huge allotments of angelic ministrants and directing them to you. We are bringing ascended master techniques to you. We are bringing to you the process of development that you may profit in the thought that by your profiting and by your soul expansion and by your readying yourself for the ascension that we will be blessing the world beyond its expectations. This has been the purposes of this conference and it was Mother Mary who won the day for the students of light for she pled for them and said, we have often worked for the ingrates of the world we have often worked for those who were not concerned for themselves, for the rebels, and for those who had no profitable fruit. Let us now turn our attention upon the children who utter our name daily, whose every thought reaches out and aspires to help mankind. Let us walk the earth through them, she said. And so the decree went forth and became an ascended master fiat. And the determination was made that we would walk the earth through you, that we would move through your mind, that we would speak through your lips, that we would flash our concepts into the world through you. And thus, the kingdom of God from the invisible octaves of light descends now to the students to see that it may make their honor bright. You are the representatives of God. You are those that shall go forth this year and then when you come for review before us next year, we will make a determination as to whether or not to continue the grant. You have an opportunity now to hold for the forces of light on earth the marshalling power of the great white brotherhood. See what you can do with it, for on your every act depends the future of this grant and as to whether or not it can be expanded until the angels of God will live in mortal form by walking the earth in your consciousness. Watch for new flashes of inspiration. Watch for new bursts of enthusiasm, of protection. Watch for the unexpected manifestation of the masters peering through the veil. Watch for symbolic eyes appearing in the clouds and behind the face of the flowers. Watch for the tender, sweet smile of a babe as you walk by and smile upon him. Watch, for behold, I shall stand by you, and I shall not be removed into a corner, and the masters of wisdom shall blaze in every flame, and shall pour their perfume out through the flowers, and shall move in the breezes of the Holy Spirit, and shall smile upon mankind through your eyes. Be grateful, be joyous, for this means a greater than ordinary blessing to you this year. I thank you.